Bible app, we're going to look at the Gospel of Luke this morning. Just kidding, John. I do have a decent idea what I'm talking about this morning, but it's in John. In John chapter 20, we're going to read the verse 23 verses of that together. So John chapter 20, verses 1 through 23. I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. It's going to be on the screens for you. Um, but read along with me. If you have your um, paper copy, uh, grab a pen. You might want to underline some things, circle some things that might draw your attention to or stick out to you. Um, but you might want to take some notes on. John chapter 20, verses 1 through 23. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and that would be referring to John, this gospel that we're reading. She said, they've taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and we don't know where they've put him. Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stopped and looked in and saw... The linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there, while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For until then they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the dead. Then they went home. Mary was standing outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she stooped and looked in. She saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked her. Because they have taken away my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where they have put him. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Dear woman... Why are you crying? Jesus asked her. Who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. Sir, she said, if you have taken him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will go and get him. Mary, Jesus said. She turned to him and cried out, Rabboni, which in Hebrew is Hebrew for teacher. Don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I haven't yet ascended to the Father. But go find my brothers. I love how he calls his friends, his disciples, my brothers. Go find my brothers and tell them, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord. Then she gave him his message. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said to them, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. When I was in high school, I didn't know what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Anybody ever do those job shadowing things? Like in junior high, high school, you did job shadowing. Well, I, sh I, I job shadowed my grandpa, who was a meat cutter. I thought, well, I don't know, man, I'll cut, cut up cows for a living. I don't know. So I did that. I, I shadowed a, a vet. I thought, well, maybe I'd be a vet. And then I discovered they had to be smart. So I couldn't be a vet. So I was getting to be a junior in high school. I thought, well, I... I I don't, I, I don't feel called to the military, so I'm not going to do that. Well, I guess I'll go to college. And so I went to college, and I didn't know what I was going to major in, so I thought, well, I'll major in elementary education because you don't have to be too smart to be an elementary education teacher. <laughs> I learned. <laughs> wow, hostile crowd. I learned that yeah, you do have to be smart to be an elementary education teacher. I can't do that. So, well, I'll be a pastor. <laughs> Here I am. 
And it was kind of one of those things, I started out as an elementary education teacher, and I thought I wanted to teach fourth and fifth graders. Now, those of you who are teachers may know that that's like the worst group, that nobody wants to teach those. That's what I wanted to teach. I wanted to teach the fourth and fifth grade, upper elementary. Um, but then I discovered through the education, so the first semester, they put you in a classroom. Um, to make sure, you know, you get started into it. And I, I discovered once I was in the classroom and once I got into the education major, I really didn't like kids. <laughs> um, so that I might, might want to do something else. Um, and every parent since that I would have taught is really grateful that I'm not an elementary education teacher. Because um, I grew up, I, I got spanked a few times when I was in school. Anybody else get spanked in school by their <laughs> teachers? Oh, yeah. See, those of us, we turned out all right. We got spanked. Um, I would probably still be that old school kind of. I probably got fired. Um, then also my freshman year, I started to have this desire that I, I really didn't want to be a teacher, and I discovered that, well, there's this other thing called ministry that I could go into and major in and do that for a career. So I went into ministry major, switched majors, went into those classes and was working through that process and it, it, was very, it very quickly came to me that this is going to change my life, that this is going to change everything about me, that I'm not going to have like a teacher where I would um, have a career for 25 or 30 years and live in the same house, live in the same community, know the same people and kind of grow up together, that I was going to have to move around. Well, when I kind of realized that, I realized, well, that's going to affect my spouse, too, that my spouse is now going to be impacted by that, and I need to have a spouse that feels called to ministry, too, and that's not a, that's not a common thing, that's not a normal thing, um, so I have to find the right spouse, and so it started to affect that, and it's also going to impact my children, it's going to impact their lives, it's going to impact their family, and how are they going to respond, and so this, the impact of going into ministry, all of a sudden, very quickly, I began to realize that this is not just about me anymore. The, the ripple effects of this are, are pretty big, and the impact, not just on this decision and on what I major in and what I do for a career is going to affect and impact a lot of people. That's a, that's a pretty serious thing, but it became it was so compelling to me that I had to do it. And we could go into what it means to be have a call on your life, and it doesn't matter what's a, a call to ministry or a call to a factory or a call to uh, being a chef or cooking or whatever it is, that we have a call to those things that impacts us and affects us. Um, when Becky and I were dating and she realized I was gonna, knew that I was going to be a pastor, that was, that was a moment for her <laughs> of what do I do with this? Am I going to, because she knew what it meant to be a pastor's wife. So it's going to have to change her. And it, We spent a lot of time working through that of what it means to be a pastor's wife and then I thought I wanted to be a farmer. She told me, it took me a long time to be a pastor's wife. I did not sign up to be a, a farmer's wife. You are not going to be a farmer. Like, yes, dear. The ripple effects and what it does to our life is not just about that moment when we make a decision, when I decided, yes, I'm going to be a pastor. It doesn't stop there. That moment of giving ourselves to Jesus spreads through our life and impacts the rest of our life. In 1555, there was this guy named Thomas Hawks. 1555. How many of you are a fan of Downton Abbey? Three of you. Wow, okay, a few more honest people. Downton Abbey, if you haven't watched it, shame on you. You really ought to watch it. It's a really good series. I watched the entire, I, to I, I told you before, I like chick flicks. I'm not ashamed, I'm still a man. I like those kind of shows. Downton Abbey is kind of that, it's set in old England. Well, it's actually old English style, but it's the early 1900s. But there's this big house, the servants, you know, all this. They have the butlers and they have the cooks and they have all this thing. Well, Thomas Hawks in 1555, kind of like Downton Abbey, he was a servant in a house of the Lord of Oxford. And he was doing his job just as a servant and a house of royalty would do. And he was just doing his job. And he was doing it well. 
Well, he got married and he had a child, and because in 1555, if you know anything about England, you know anything about that system, the Church of England controlled the politics of the day, they controlled the country. And Thomas Hawks and his wife and his child, they needed to baptize the child as a Catholic. And Hawks said, no, I'm not going to do that. I, I'm not going to, I don't want to get, I'm not gonna, trying to, attempting to slam the Catholic Church at all in any way, shape, or, but he said, I'm, I'm going to stick to what I believe the Bible teaches, and I think the Catholic Church is wrong in their teaching. And so I am not going to baptize my child as a Catholic. Well, he goes through this trial with the bishop, and the bishop accuses him of a lot of things, and they become this debate about the Bible and what's supposed to be in the Bible and what's not supposed to be in the Bible, and, and you need to baptize your child Catholic, and Hawks said no. So the bishop, Bishop Bonner, sentenced Hawks to death to be burned at the stake. And so his sentence was coming up and his execution date was coming up and his friends around him were nervous for him and they were nervous for himself and they were, they were worried about whether their faith could survive the fire. And they, convinced, and they talked to Hawks through this and they said, if it's possible, if your faith maintains and you still have peace while you're in the fire, would you be able to possibly lift your arm up? And Hawks agreed and said, I would be happy to do that. And you can read the story of Thomas Hawks, and I will bear you the, the really, the seriously gory details about being burned at the stake and what happened to Hawks' body while he was in the flame. But I'll say this, when he was no longer physically able to speak, his fingers were gone. Everybody in the crowd thought he was dead. He raised both of his arms up over his head, clapped three times, and died. The entire crowd broke out into praise and worship because of Hawk's faith. Here was this guy who was just a servant. I don't know what his job was, but he was a servant to royalty. Just doing his life, just living his life, trying to be faithful, ends up, what does the impact of serving Jesus do for his life? It's not just about this decision, but it impacted how he served, and it impacted how he died, and regardless of what it meant for his family, that he was going to stick to the truth of the gospel. When we look at the gospel, and I'm not going to give you evidence for the empty tomb. I'm going to go on the assumption that most of you believe that the tomb is empty. I'm going to go on the assumption that what it says in the Bible is true. Do you know that all secular history accepts the life, death, and empty tomb account of Jesus? Secular history, it doesn't matter. It's, it's stated, it's an, it's an assumed fact that Jesus lived, that he died on a cross, and that where he was buried is empty. So what do we do with the empty tomb? What do we do with that? We, we, um, Becky and I had the, the privilege of being there and, and being in both places. And I think, well, he was either buried in this tomb or he was buried in this tomb. They're both empty. Uh, like I said, secular history agrees, world history agrees that the tomb is empty. I was watching a history program yesterday, and there was this professor from Princeton, a religion pastor, professor at Princeton, talking about the empty tomb. A, he, was, he was a secularist, so he didn't believe in Jesus, but he said the tomb is empty. His opinion was that they just went to the wrong tomb. His opinion that when you prepare the body, they would, that was a temp, where Jesus was buried first was a temporary location, that he was going to be moved later to a family tomb or to a more permanent burial spot. And so when the ladies showed up, the tomb was empty, and he acknowledges that, but his opinion was, well, the body was just moved, which is a common opinion. Uh, it's common to think that, well, maybe the disciples stole the body. It's common to think in the story account that is recorded here in the Gospels that um, the Pharisees, the, the religious leaders, bribed the Roman guards to tell the story 
the disciples stole the body. So the disciples showed up. I love this story. Because the disciples showed up who were fishermen, tax collectors. Um, one was a zealot. Um, so they, they weren't soldiers by any stretch of the imagination, right? So they show up and somehow overpower a professional army. They somehow show up and defeat the guard, the Roman guard that was stationed there, and steal the body. You know, psychologically, no psychologist, no sociologist would ever say that somebody dies for a known lie. People will die for something they, they believe to be true that could later be proved out to be a lie, but they believe it's true, so they die for it. Nobody ever dies for something they know for a fact to be a lie. All of the disciples, except John, were martyred for their faith. If they had stolen the body, there's no way they would have died for telling the story and, and believing that Jesus had risen. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it says that uh, Jesus appeared to over 500 people. So there's multiple people telling the same story of the empty tomb, telling the same story that Jesus rose from the dead, that witnessed his resurrection. One of my favorite theories that I think is just completely ridiculous is called the swoon theory. Anybody ever hear the swoon theory before? A few of you? No, oh, those of you who are professionals. So the swoon theory is this idea that because of the trauma of the cross, Jesus just simply passed out, that he wasn't really dead. And so when they took him down, they prepared his body, they wrapped him in a cloth, they put him in this, the coolness and the dampness of the tomb, revived him, and so he came too. And he somehow gets out of the wrappings on, uh, that he was wrapped in, and somehow he moves a two-ton stone from the inside, the stone rolled across the opening of the tomb, and so there was no place to grab it. Somehow, Jesus moves in his condition. He moves a two-ton stone silently so that he then escapes the guards. Or he pushes the stone over, overpowers the guards, and escapes. The, the, the stories of the empty tomb and the explanations that we come to have tried to explain the empty tomb are all lacking significantly in believability or in rationale. While it may not be logical, the only logical explanation to the tomb being empty is that Jesus rose from the dead. That Jesus was who he said he was. He was God. He was the Messiah. He was the Savior. He did die. And we know medically from the accounts in the gospel, when he was pierced in the side, it says blood and water flowed, it's a sign of death, piercing the pericardial sac of the heart. The blood had started to separate because Jesus was dead. These soldiers were experts in death. They dealt with death all day long. They looked at Jesus. They knew he was dead. They pierced it. Blood and water flows out. Jesus was dead. The tomb is empty. The only logical explanation is that he was who he said he was. And that the tomb is empty because he is our Savior and he rose from the dead. The question that begs to be answered is what do we do with that information? What do you do with the empty tomb? What do you do with the fact that, that Jesus has risen from the dead and how does it impact your life? You see, we, we think we can, we often think, and too many churches today teach, that you can accept Jesus, and that's it. You pray the prayer, you, you bend the knee, you, you, you say the thing, you do the stuff, and you're okay. Go to church once in a while, and you're good. The thing about the empty tomb is it demands for us, and it requires of us to deal with that. What do we do with that? You know, we, um, like I said, Becky and I had the, the privilege to be in Israel and to see both of those tombs. And I can tell you my personal choice, my, my personal favorite one, the garden tomb that I, that I tend to lean towards. Um, to be in that tomb <laughs> is life-changing. 
I mean, to be where the cross was was life changing. To to be able to visualize and to see this and think, he's not here. See, we can we can get so busy with our life, we can get so focused on on living that we we tend to not consider the empty tomb. We tend to not consider the cross and what Jesus went through. And we kind of just kind of just think, well, it's, it's a really cool story. And yeah, I'm grateful for it. And yes, it gives me forgiveness. And I don't know about you, but maybe when I, when I was a kid, not maybe, when I was a kid, did anybody else do this? Well, I can do this thing that's wrong, that's sin. I can do this thing, and I can just ask for forgiveness. Anybody else ever do that? We can take the cross and we can take the empty tomb for granted. We can just assume that we're going to be okay because, well, the tomb is empty. But it doesn't really impact our life. It really doesn't affect change in our life. And the tomb, because of its emptiness and because of the claims of Jesus, it requires us to do something with that information. And it's not something that we can just take and we can just say, well, yeah, it's going to help me make a better, be a better person. It might help me be a better husband. It might help me be a better employee. It might help me do this. But it really doesn't impact my life, and it really doesn't translate from Sunday to Monday or Friday. But if we look at the impact of the tomb on our life and the fact that it is empty, it affects everything. It affects everything. The way you think, it affects the way you talk, it affects the way you live, it affects where you go, it affects what you do, it affects how you interact and talk with people, Mm -hmm. it affects your politics. And I'm not talking Republican or Democrat, but it affects your politics. It affects your Facebook. It affects your Instagram. Because if Jesus is who he said he was, Look at verse 9, what we just read, the, the John chapter 20, verse 9. Verse 8, I'm going back up to verse 8. Then the disciple had reached the tomb first, that was John, went in and saw and believed. Then verse 9, for until then they still hadn't understood the scriptures that Jesus must rise from the dead. Grasping and understanding the empty tomb brings clarity to your life. It brings focus and purpose to your life. That you look through difficulties, you look through hardships, you look through all those things that can overwhelm us in life, and it it brings clarity and understanding of who Jesus is. We have the ability and the privilege of hindsight and looking back a couple thousand years. The disciples didn't, but as soon as they understood and encountered the empty tomb, They understood. It makes sense. The same thing can be true in your life. When you grasp the empty tomb and you understand the empty tomb, it can bring understanding to your life. We talked about this Wednesday night and almost got upset with Randy for for maybe taking some of my notes this morning. But in Luke chapter 24, verse 5, the other Luke's account of the the resurrection. And Luke, Luke writes this. When the angels asked Mary, why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? Why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? What do we look for in our life that is dead? We look at relationships. We can look at jobs, we can look at family, we can look at all kinds of things to, to try and bring life to us. We can look at alcohol, we can look at drugs, we can look at those things to try and numb us. All those things that I was, why are you looking for something who is alive among the dead? That Jesus brings life to us. And we can look, the old country song, looking for love in all the wrong places. We can look in all kinds of places and all kinds of ways and all kinds of things for life, for hope, when it's found in an empty tomb. 
and was found in an empty tomb. Why do we look for the living among the dead? Why do we focus so much on this life and in this world and answers that this world provides when they're not there, they're in an empty tomb? The word enough is, a, is an interesting word for me because what is enough? What's enough? I mean, how many fries, French fries is enough? Um, that's how I get the extra large fries because I, I can't get enough French fries. I can't eat enough hamburgers. Um, what's enough? What's enough in your retirement account? What's, en- what's enough in your pension? What's enough in your 401k? What's enough health? Um, what's enough in your relationships? What's enough? It seems like we always want more, don't we? You get a little bit and you want a little bit more. You get a new to you vehicle and you really like it until you see a better one that somebody in your neighbor's driveway. And all of a sudden your new to you vehicle isn't enough. You get a nice camper and you pull into a campground. I say this as guilty. You get a nice camper and you love your camper and you pull into a campground like, oh, that one's bigger and better. I only got one slide out. That one's got 17. <laughs> I mean, I, I could pull, pull that with my truck and then open the back of the camper and pull my truck inside. And they're like, ooh, I need one of those. Enough. The same thing, I think, translates spiritually. What's enough? Are are we satisfied with just knowing Jesus? Are are we satisfied with just salvation? Are we satisfied with a little bit of hope? Are we satisfied with when when life really gets bad and, well, I guess all I can do now is pray? Is that really enough? Is that really what you want out of a relationship with Jesus? Is that really enough? Is it really what you want for someone who conquered death? I mean, how many of you people, how, how many of you know somebody who died and rose again and is still alive and has been alive for 2,000 years? There's only one. So the question is, is he enough? And the answer is yes. What are you struggling with? What are you dealing with? What's the questions that you have in life? Jesus is enough. When we think maybe we've gotten to the limit and we've maybe, well, this is all I need, and then we find ourselves we need more, we think, well, it can't get any worse, and then what happens? It gets worse. Well, I can't sink any lower, and we go lower. Well, I'm glad nothing else can break. Glad nothing else can go wrong. I'm glad I don't ever, I'll never have to another have, have another surgery again. And then what happens? Boom. We go lower. Say, Jesus is enough. Wherever you are this morning, Jesus is enough. Why? Because the empty tomb proves it. The empty tomb proves it. When you enter that life with Jesus, I can promise you it'll mess with you. It'll mess with the rest of your life. It'll impact how you view your health. It'll impact how you choose a spouse. It'll impact what you do with your family. It'll impact maybe where you live. It'll impact the job that you have. It'll impact your medical decisions. The empty tomb changes everything. Everything. But I can promise you this. It's enough. He's enough. You can want more, you can desire more, but the Bible says he meets our needs. He is enough. He's enough. What do you need today? If you could ask him for anything, what would you ask him for? He's enough. It may not be what you're given, it may not be what he gives to you, but he's enough. And if you don't know him today, I'm going to invite you to have a relationship with him. Maybe you've kind of walked away a little bit. Maybe you've kind of forgotten about him. Maybe you made that decision 20, 30, 50 years ago. And you've kind of forgotten. You've taken him for granted. 
I want to invite you this morning to say yes to Jesus. To accept the empty tomb that all of history already accepts, but to believe that he is our Messiah and he is Lord and he is God and he is deserving and he is enough. We're going to close with a special. So all of you who are involved in that, come on up. Um, But are you, that question can be a haunting question in your life. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Are you looking among the dead for the living? Are you, are you looking and searching for life? It's found in an empty tomb. It's not found in anything else. So let's listen to this together. <laughs> 